Good evening. I'm Dr. Max Gomez. I am the medical correspondent for CBS here in New York. And it is my pleasure to once again be moderating a webinar here for Columbia Children's Hospital. And we have a really interesting and very important panel uh, going on tonight because it's such a hot area uh, that hopefully will save a lot of uh, heartache for, for couples and, and will make uh, things a lot better for all of us. Anyway, uh, you'll see, this is all about genetic testing, pre-implantation genetic testing uh, and afterwards as well. So a uh, couple of little housekeeping items. Uh, the webinar tonight is being recorded. It will live on Columbia Children's YouTube channel. Uh, after a day or so, it'll be posted there. So you can go back and refer to it. You don't need to take notes and there won't be a quiz later. Uh, and if you have any questions while we are going through here, you can put them into the chat box or the Q&A box there at the bottom. Uh, I'll review them and I'll try to work them into uh, our discussion uh, tonight. So with that as an introduction, uh, let me introduce Dr. Zeb Williams, who will introduce our panel. Zeb? Thank you very much, Dr. Gomez, Max, as you prefer to be called. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience, uh, to Dr. Williams for organizing this, and to our, our really wonderful panel. It is very exciting to be here with all of you and to share what I think is such a, a promising, exciting area in medicine that's undergone so many changes just in the past few years to be able to come together like this and to share the, the real advances that have been made that can very directly and wonderfully positively impact our patients, your patients, I think is a great opportunity. It is though a, a very um, new area. And so I think to have this panel here is really wonderful. It is a very illustrious and accomplished panel. And I think even just looking across everybody that's here, what's particularly exciting is in terms of the patient's journey, you really see the full spectrum, starting from some of the groundbreaking work in terms of discovering genetic causes for some of the most devastating diseases, developing novel tests to be able to look at them, having the fertility treatment, the expertise care to be able to manage, having the appropriate genetic counselors be able to guide the couple, the woman and couple through this difficult situation, the ability to do the cutting edge prenatal diagnosis. Um, and you really see here the full spectrum of the integrated level of care that, that's so important for the patients. So I wanna now sort of go through some of our wonderful panelists um, and get to introduce them. First is uh, Dr. Wendy Chung. Dr. Chung is a Kennedy family professor. She is the chief of the division of clinical genetics in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, she is a resource leader in precision medicine really one of those people that when you hear of these novel complex genetic diseases, pretty, you, you can be pretty sure when you look at the paper at the last author, it's going to be her. Um, mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to have you here for that. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Thanks, so. Next to Dr. Chung, at least on my screen, is Dr. Wapner. Dr. Wapner is um, the professor of infectious and gynecology. He's the director of reproductive health. He's the one who's really led so much of the groundbreaking pioneering work in terms of prenatal diagnosis. So much of what we know in terms of CVS and the ability to do CVS for prenatal testing, the application of genetics to women's health was really led by him. Um, certainly one of the great giants in obstetric, obstetrical women's health and genetics. So thank you, Dr. Wapner, for being here. Thank you. Next to Dr. Wapner is Stephanie Gallery. So Stephanie is somebody we work with all the time, a uh, genetic counselor and reproductive genetics, and somebody who just seems to have at her fingertips all the questions that patients have. She seems to have the answer and the right way to phrase them and explain them to patients. Um, so someone we work with all the time, it's wonderful to see you here. And then we have to, to my right, at least on the screen, Dr. Cripson, Sinem Cripson. Sinem Cripson is double board certified OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist. So she's a fertility specialist, but far beyond that, she's also the director of the pre-pregnancy genetics program and somebody that's taken the whole field of pre-implantation genetic testing and really helped build this comprehensive team to guide patients, their providers, the whole network of healthcare providers around them through some of these very difficult, um, challenging, 
but ultimately incredibly successful uh, treatment options that exist. Um, so it's wonderful. I have the, the privilege of getting to work with her every day. And it's wonderful to see you here, Dr. Cripson. Um, and I am Zeb Williams. I am the director of Columbia University Fertility Center. And basically get the pleasure of getting to work with this entire panel. So it's good to have you all here. Very good, Zeb. Thank you. Uh, and let's just get right into it. And by the way, I've asked the permission of our panelists uh, to use their first names. I'm not uh, being uh, disrespectful of them. I think it just makes everything a little easier and a little more approachable. But let's start with uh, Sinem. Uh, because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, understanding kind of uh, the basics or the foundation here about um, pre-implantation genetic testing and how and when it's actually done. Can you start us out with that, please? So pre-implantation genetic testing is actually done in the United States in more than 50% of the IVF cycles. And that embryo testing is typically for checking for chromosome numbers, uh, like Down syndrome uh, would be picked up there. But also the pre-implantation genetic testing that we are going to talk about today is the pre-implantation genetic testing for uh, couples or individuals who are at risk of passing on a certain genetic condition. And that is pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic disorders. So that's actually one to two percent of all the IVF cycles in the United States. Hmm. So just to be clear, obviously, this has to be done with embryos that are um, generated, if you will, uh, through IVF, right? Um, how is it, and I'll throw this out to, uh, you know, to the whole panel, anyone can jump in here. How is it actually performed? Can you actually take a cell out and not impact an embryo? At what stage are you doing this? So in order to do that, Max, to genetically test embryos, you need to do IVF. And uh, the IVF process is the woman undergoes through ovarian stimulation, and then we collect the eggs. Uh, the partner gives the sperm sample. We inject the eggs with his sperm. Then we culture the embryos mm -hmm. to uh, about one week. And at that stage, when we biopsy the embryos, it has not been shown to be impactful. So we are what we are biopsying is about a hundred cell structure. And it's very well defined what makes the baby, what makes the placenta. So what we biopsy is what makes the placenta. And we take about five to 10 cells from what makes the placenta. And we freeze the embryo with the latest technique, flash freezing technique. And the embryo frozen, it, it does not have a shelf life. It could be frozen for 10 years, two months, and then the biopsy sample is sent to a specialty lab for genetic analysis. So that part of genetic testing, so everything is what we do in an IVF center every day. The difference here when we are testing for a condition a family could inherit, uh, the difference here is we are testing for that specific condition, okay? And also we could add chromosome number testing, complete mm -hmm. chromosome analysis to that. So that's the process in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So in all cases, it sounds like, or I presume, uh, aside from just doing chromosome counting, we need to know the genetic basis of a particular disease or, or defect. Is that the case, Stephanie, that we have to know? That's the understanding, no? For for the specific PGTM that Sina mentioned, the monogenic testing, PGT, to do the embryo testing, yes, we have to have a target specific thing we're looking for. We cannot screen the embryos for all genetic diseases or uh, all genetic risks. We can do screening for chromosome problems, like Sina said, looking at the 46 chromosomes and making sure numerically they're represented correctly. That's the broadest screening we can do on embryos. 
pretty but straightforward, for, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Let me no, I'm just going to repeat myself again and say to to the PTTM is is most impactful and really can only be done when we have a specific genetic thing to target for. We're not looking at all of the genes of the feta or the embryo at this point. We can only look for what the family is specifically at risk for. Ah, got you. So, Wendy, perhaps can you tell us? I don't know if you can go through all of the things, all 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 of the potential excuse me, potential targets, but what are, uh, you know, what are highest up on the hit list here? Well, so numerically, there are about 7,000 conditions that we theoretically could screen for, as Stephanie said, that are monogenic or single gene conditions. I will say, I don't think all of them need to be screened for. Um, so I think there, when we think of this and when a family thinks of this, they think about things that there are no treatments, there are no cures, they're very, very serious conditions. So as an example, when you think about something like Tay-Sachs, which is a lethal condition, 100% lethal condition, um, many times in young children, um, it, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible to see your child go through that. And so one way of avoiding that is to use this technology. Um, like I said, as we do this, and this Stephanie was alluding to, we have to start with knowing what the condition is within the family. And so that's oftentimes where uh, we'll come in, someone like me, in terms of making that diagnosis. If they have a child with a certain type of condition, they want to know if it's genetic, if it might happen again, if it does have a high chance of happening again, can we do anything to prevent it? Um, that's where that, you, you mentioned a journey, that's where that journey oftentimes starts, is knowing um, again, either a child, a parent, even a more extended family member, but answering the question, is it genetic? What is it? And then can we come up with a test to be able to use on the embryo? So Ron, I think that kind of uh, tees it up for you there is, you know, how, how are couples and recognize the ones who might benefit from uh, this PGT then? Is it always because something has happened uh, previously, or uh, how do you decide that it's worth uh, doing all of this? Um, there's a number of different ways. And as with everything in genetics, this continues to change almost daily. Um, one technique is <clears throat> for diseases that are autosomal recessive, in which both parents are carriers and they have a 25% chance that every child would be affected. The old way that we used to know this is that they would have a child and then we would know who they would have an affected child and then we would know the rest of their pregnancies had a one in four <clears throat> chance. And again, as Wendy alluded to, um, Tay-Sachs is an example, cystic fibrosis is an example, et cetera. But starting about ooh, almost 30 or 40 years ago with Tay-Sachs disease, we began to learn that we can identify the parents that are carrying a disorder before they have an affected child. And screening for Tay-Sachs disease was done in the Jewish population and it worked perfectly. It almost, um, it almost eliminated uh, children being born with this horrible lethal disorder. However, with time, we found that we now have the ability to screen parents for a multitude of diseases, not because they belong to a religious group or not because they belong to an ethnic group, but with, with molecular diagnosis right now, we can take a woman and screen her, whether or not she's a carrier for four or 500 genetic diseases. If we then test her partner, and he carries the same thing, they would have a one in four chance. But we can now know this before they even get pregnant. Unfortunately, a lot of that screening is still done in the obstetrician's office after they've already established a pregnancy. And it's our goal to move that into the generalist's office, which is exactly why I'm glad that we have lots of generalists on, their, on the call because they could screen people even before they got pregnant. And just as Sinem was talking about, if both parents carry the disorder, they could have PGT-M and eliminate ever having an affected child. So as I said, one of the, one of the main reasons um, that we can identify them is just by population screen. The other thing that we now can do 
is, you know, congenital anomalies occur in about 3% of all pregnancies. And we found out that at least half of those, maybe even a bit more, are, are genetic. Some of them are de novo, meaning it's just a spontaneous mutation that happened. But we now know that there are parents, and I, I think Sina may want to say a little more about that, um, in, in which they're mosaics, meaning that they can have a recurrence of this. And those are other candidates. We can eliminate them from ever happening a child with that. So there's a lot of ways that um, families can, can be identified as being at risk and, and potentially benefiting from PGT. Fascinating. So seeing them go into this mosaic uh, issue that, that Ron just brought up. Yes. So thank you so much uh, bringing it up, Ron. So actually, um, all of us at Columbia, uh, Mandy, Zev, uh, Ron, we have a um, ongoing study that we actually, so far, if there is mosaicism uh, on the sperm, uh, it's, uh, it wasn't detected before because we didn't have the techniques for that. Uh, but at Columbia University, uh, we have uh, the study that we uh, run a semen analysis on a, a man who has a new mutation uh, in the, his offspring. It could be a previous pregnancy, it could be a child, uh, but uh, the technology that we have, it allows detection of the mutation in the sperm if there is mosaicism in his sperm. So that's uh, what uh, Ron is mentioning. Hmm. Zev, I don't mean to leave you out of this. Uh, no, I, I'm enjoying this conversation. This is wonderful. <laughs> okay, okay, good. I, I, don't, I never want to leave the boss out here. Um, <laughs> Hardly. You, you deal a lot with pa uh, parents, patients, right? Yeah. Uh, and as with any, uh, I have found in, in trying to explain some of these things to uh, the general public, uh, which is what I, I do all the time, I find that there, is a, there are a lot of misconceptions. Talk to me about what are some of the more common misconceptions that people have uh, about genetic testing. It's a great question. I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that I hear a lot is that parents who've had a child who may have some of these really heartbreaking, devastating genetic conditions feel that they have no choice but to either take the risk of having another child with this condition or not have any more children. I think the biggest misconception is a knowledge gap, which is that this sort of capability exists, that medicine has taken such a leap from even 10, 15 years ago, where now we can assure parents who've had these well-defined genetic conditions that they don't have to be in fear of having another child with them. It could be for conditions that Wendy and Ron spoke about, like Tay-Sachs, Gaucher's, cystic fibrosis, the well-known ones. It could also be for conditions where they may be the only people in the world who are at risk for it. Um, and we've taken care of couples like that, where the mutation is so novel, so rare, that there may only be a few people who have it. It's not like a known condition people have heard of. And even in those cases, when we know the genetic basis for it, they can have the, the confidence, the peace of mind, the, the reassurance that they can have another pregnancy not affected with some of these terrible conditions that result in either very sick children or, or stillbirths and, and other complications. Can I add to that? Oh. Please, I, I, so, exactly where I was going, go ahead. PGT is extremely helpful and beneficial for those families who've had the heartbreak or want to reduce the genetic risk, but we have to um, manage expectations too. And just like anything, we can't guarantee a pregnancy and we can't guarantee a healthy pregnancy or a healthy birth because random things can happen and not everything is genetic. Like we can't guarantee there's not gonna be risk for uh, cerebral palsy or intellectual disability because we can't test for it. And while everything we talk about is statistics, there's a risk. They have a one in four chance of having an affected child. There's a one in four chance of an affected embryo for these recessive conditions. But 
each patient has a different experience with their process. We've all had patients who every embryo has been, been affected and they don't have a normal one to transfer or every embryo is normal. And so it's, while we have these stats, each journey is different. And so pay, sometimes patients on the other end of what Zeph was saying is who don't know it's an option, sometimes think PGT is gonna solve all their problems and that they're gonna get pregnant in no time. Um, and just managing those expectations that all of us have to do is another misconception of PGT. We, we can't, we can help prevent disease, but we can't help guarantee a healthy pregnancy. I think that's an important point that Stephanie is raising. And, and one of the ways we describe it is sort of there's a risk that all of us have um, when we try to have a child. And that's sort of like a baseline risk. It does adjust based on, on age and other factors, but there's sort of like this baseline risk. Then layered on top of that will be these additional increased risks due to the genetic mutation. Where the technology and this approach is helpful is in reducing that additional risk. But of course, you know, we have an audience of, of pediatricians, obstetricians on the call. While all of us would love to ensure a healthy pregnancy, a healthy childhood, there's so many factors. That obviously, that's beyond any person's capability. What is within the capability, though, is in these defined cases mm -hmm. to be able to, to avoid a repeat of those known genetic mutations. And, and Stephanie, you're right. That's an important point of distinction. Right. I remember, uh, you know, when I talk to people, I often hear people want a, um, a guarantee, as you said, that something will, will, will work before they get into it. And I always remember a, uh, uh, a doctor once that I was overhearing a conversation about Mrs. Smith, who wanted a guarantee that her surgery would work. And the other doctor said, if she wants a guarantee, tell her to buy a toaster. <laughs> Because you just can't do that in, in medicine, right? Um, this is not an inexpensive process. IVF already is, is expensive. Uh, so, Wendy, maybe you can uh, address how do you discuss that co the cost in terms of taking that extra step and whether it's worth um, the extra cost for uh, for parents to do this? What are we talking about? So as a pediatrician that takes care of children that have these types of disabilities and genetic conditions, the cost of that emotionally, socially, on the family, on financially, on the family, on society, uh, pales in comparison to what we're talking about in terms of the cost of in vitro fertilization or this testing. So um, I, I don't think there's any comparison. Uh, I'll let Zev comment more in terms of the actual cost, but in a good way, increasingly uh, costs are covered by insurance and even state-by-state uh, -state legislation. But uh, again, I don't think there's any comparison for many of these conditions. We know the cost actually is over, over a million for many cases and in many cases well beyond that. So um, this is really uh, absolutely not in comparison, not very expensive. Not, also not easy to get parents to look in that uh, to put it into that context either, I suspect. Yeah. Um, are not, um, isn't IVF though in general associated occasionally with some sorts of genetic anomalies, just, just doing IVF by itself? This is a question that just came in. Yeah. So, now, do you want to... so the oh, risk definitely. of congenital anomalies in the general population is about 3.1%. And uh, with IVF, it was found to be 3.4%, which is um, slightly more increased, but that congenital anomaly risk is mostly attributed to the reason that we are doing IVF. So for example, if there is a male infertility and a man is having a, a child uh, through ICSI injection of the sperm inside the egg, and otherwise there was no way he could have a child. He could inherit male infertility related genes to his son. And it's uh, more likely that his son could have undescended testicles or uh, cryptorchidism. So these could be uh, increasing the risk that slight increase could be attributed to that majority of the babies born as a result of IVF are healthy 
There are several studies in their long-term outcomes, their development, and they do academically really well, actually. And some studies show they academically even do better than natural pregnancies. Uh, but certainly there are some bias that play a role. Uh, but uh, IVF itself, it really is not, does not pose a risk of congenital anomaly. It's just the patient population that you're selecting for explains that slight increase. And maybe it was a Definitely terminology add something. Yeah, go ahead. question. IVF doesn't increase or introduce genetic diseases, monoallelic genetic diseases. Um, I like hesitate to even bring this other part up, but um, like, so the, the, the joining of egg and sperm doesn't increase the risk of chromosome disorders. As Zev mentioned, there's background and age related risk for that, but the process doesn't cause it. And the process doesn't cause genetic diseases like achondroplasia any differently than a natural conception would. The one thing in the literature that we see a slight association with increased genetic risk is what Sina was mentioning when you take one sperm from the man and introduce it directly to the egg. Um, some study, studies show a slight increased risk of how the genetic information is expressed. We call it methylation, but the risk is not elevated enough to be considered high risk. Um, it's not enough for us to consider testing based on having IVF or ICSI in a pregnancy for that methylation issue or in a kid after being born with it, unless there's other clinical signs from it. But otherwise, the genetic risk from IVF is, is not increased. Got it. Ron, since we, we talked about cost uh, a little bit, let's go back to that for a second. Um, for couples who want a child, but they don't want or can't afford uh, PGT, are there other options available to them that, that can take them part of the way without spending as much money? Uh, there are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there are ways that one can do prenatal diagnosis on the pregnancy. In other words, they don't do pre-implantation diagnosis. They throw the dice, so to speak, because even with recessive diseases, there's a three out of four chance the child will not have the disorder. So as early as nine or 10 weeks, if they don't undergo this, we can um, do CVS, which is a sample, is, which is a test in which we just take a small piece of the placenta, and by 11 weeks, they would um, know whether or not the fetus was affected. And unfortunately, there are certain patients, even at a 25% risk, that just can't afford. I mean, you know, it was said that insurance picks it up. Uh, you know, the, the cost is phenomenal. It, it's actually more than a year's worth of pay for some of our um, patients and we don't get insurance to pay and insurance will pay for the prenatal testing. So for those patients in who it's a financial issue, you can test the pregnancy once it's been conceived. They would know by 11 weeks whether or not the pregnancy is affected. And then they'd have to make the really difficult decision of whether or not they were going to continue or not continue the pregnancy. The majority of patients, and again, thank God we have genetic counselors like Steph. The majority of patients don't get pregnant and then make the decision. They actually, it's part of a plan in which they say, what are my options? What are they going to cost me? And so they understand the implications of, of each of them. So yes, there are, there are options and uh, it would be wonderful if, um, and, and I, I think Wendy made the point well, an insurance company, if there's an affected child is gonna spend millions of dollars. So it's not just the cost of the patient, it's what the insurance company will wind up having to pay and offset that with what prenatal um, or PGT would be. It, it's, it's minuscule, but unfortunately right now, that's not the way insurance companies think. They're hoping that any sick person is going to go to another insurance company and not deal with them. And it's a, it's a, I don't think I have to tell anybody on this call. Um, it's a, it's just a crazy system right now. Yeah. It, it sounds like also it would be um, beneficial to have that plan to have that discussion before you get to the point where, okay, what are we going to do about genetic testing or, uh, CVS and uh, pregnancy termination, um, 
I guess it would be best to bring to have these couples and have that kind of discussion beforehand so that they're not slammed with that kind of a decision uh, when they're really vulnerable. Is that realistic to do that? And, and what, what couples would you then? Uh, yeah, that, that, if I may, that's exactly why we should move prenatal testing to see who are carriers before they get pregnant. And it's not unreasonable. And we talk about when that should be. Maybe at a woman's first GYN exam, maybe before she even starts dating, because then she would have that information. As, as you know, there are certain religious groups in which they have screening before pregnancy. Now they have arranged marriages and the people take their screening results and they make decisions whether or not that couple should actually get married. Now, we're not going to do that. But um, certainly the earlier someone knows that they have this, you're absolutely right. The earlier you can start planning and, and understanding what's available. But is, what's the stat still of unplanned pregnancies, though? Like, to Max's mm -hmm. point, like, how, how reasonable is that? Like, are, is it still 50% or unplanned? Uh, it's, it, it depends where you live. Yeah. Um, and it, it depends. There's a, a, a lot of factors. But, you know, if, if it, is it not our responsibility? Because if you wait until they're already, you know, at the potential to have a baby, then they're going to have an unexpended pregnancy. If you start the discussion earlier, uh, then they would have some information and they, they would know to take that serious. And just you, you asked one of the misconceptions about genetic testing. Um, one of them is that it's a scary thing to do. And people are so afraid. We can't do genetic testing on young people. We can't talk about it because they think that there's something special about a genetic test and it'll tell the rest of their lives. That's entirely untrue. It's just like any other medical test, but overcoming those misconceptions are, are not inconsequential also. Sinem, I see you're anxious to get to, to, to add something in here. I really can't agree more with you, Ron. Everything should start pre-pregnancy. And, uh, and it's great that we are talking to this audience who gets to uh, speak with the patients pre-pregnancy to educate them. First of all, the carrier screening. So that Ron is mentioning, majority of the conditions in that carrier screening does not have implications for our own health. And it's just for reproductive risk. And also, Something to relate it to the cost. A lot of carrier screening labs, if something is detected through their panel, they could be covering the analysis of the first round of the PGTM cycle. And second, insurance. There has been a positive trend in the last two years uh, in the state of New York. Uh, there is an IVF mandate in the state of New York. Uh, so majority of the people who have, um, uh, like who work for a company, more than 100 people have three IVF coverage typically. Uh, I hope the same extends to other states as well. Uh, but uh, some states like Massachusetts, uh, New Jersey, they also have uh, friendly uh, rules for uh, this PGTM, but more and more we see coverage for this. And um, so what one of the misconceptions that I would add is there are a lot of patients who think they won't have coverage, but you will only know if you have coverage if you see, uh, if you really get your options from doctors pre-pregnancy, meaning if you see a doctor like me, when you come to my office, I'll give that patient the support to get to learn about her uh, insurance coverage. And I will tell you, there are so many people that would think they have no coverage for it and thinking that is expensive, find out that they have uh, complete full coverage for this. So you'll just never know until you knock the doors. Wow. Oh, okay. Wendy, as, as uh, Zev said, that you are the uh, senior author on 
on uh, so many papers. Um, I don't think he was referring to your age. Um, what I, I know you must have something there that you all, you want people to know about. You want people to hear about in all of these things that you're working on. What do you feel is a really important uh, topic or issue about uh, this uh, genetic testing that you wish more people knew about? So I'm going to make two points. I alluded to this before, but continuing this conversation, not all genetic conditions are the same. So I, I want to be very clear about this. I, I talked about 7,000 genetic conditions, but they're not all the same in terms of severity, treatability, age of onset, any of those things. And so I'll just throw out an example to some of you who will recognize it, hereditary hemochromatosis. If you were to tell me that, you know, that's the genetic condition in the family, that's a condition that the majority of people won't ever have symptoms for. And it's a very simple treatment in terms of being a blood donor. So I, I just want to be very clear that just because there's something genetic, it doesn't mean you immediately run to do this. I, th I think we need to be careful about that. The other thing is that genetic are complicated. We're uh, increasingly appreciating this. So people will talk about things like polygenic risk scores or things where there are multiple genetic factors. It's not this monogenic or single genetic factor. We're not talking about that tonight in terms of doing polygenic risk scores for this, that, or the other and selecting embryos for that. So that, that is not at all what this discussion is about. Um, I do want to say that there are people that have uh, been to see a geneticist in the past, though, for a very very serious life-threatening condition. And it may have been even as recently as five years ago, but certainly 10 or 20 years ago in those geneticists, they just couldn't figure it out. I'll say myself included at the time, um, but I will say our technology has gotten a much better. And so even patients that I saw 10 years ago, when I look at their information again, I have to admit even one year ago, sometimes I look at their data again, and suddenly I recognize something now that I couldn't before. And that's because we're getting smarter. Collectively, we're understanding better. And so I'll just encourage families where they may have feel you know, they're giving up um, or that they don't have an answer. Um, it is useful to go back and see whether it's someone like me or, or others. Um, and I say this because sometimes uh, parents have looked at their children. They've seen a geneticist and they couldn't come up with an answer. And now the siblings are getting to the point in their lives where they're ready to have their children. And as someone said earlier, they're afraid to have children uh, because they're afraid that they might have what Johnny or Susie or whoever in their family had. And so um, it is time we have to go back to that sibling who had the condition and work them up and see if we can find an answer. But if that gives peace of mind to either say the risk to that sibling is essentially zero. And many times it is, by the way, you know, there's great reassurance that comes. Um, or if there is a significant risk, then at least they can act on that with some of the options we've talked about. So uh, don't give up. Uh, time to go back and recheck. You know, it's interesting in these uh, webinar, uh, the series that, that I've been uh, moderating, I'm hearing this more and more often that the answer that you got last year may not be the answer that you'll get today or, or next year. Go, as you said, go back and check again because we're getting smarter. We're finding more things out. Um, Zev, I'm not sure if this falls into your um, bailiwick or not, uh, but it's a question that came in here uh, about possible novel techniques whereby fetal cells can be detected in maternal blood mitigating the need for uh, full-scale uh, PGD? Well, it's a good question. That technology is sort of, I would say, on that spectrum of the prenatal diagnosis. So the patient is already pregnant. And the earlier you could diagnose if there is a genetic anomaly, the less invasive, the less risky, um, the less complex it is to manage that pregnancy. And manage, unfortunately, often would mean having the, the woman couple facing the, the decision between termination or not terminating. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, screening for circulating fetal cells is still occurring after the pregnancy has occurred. Mm -hmm. And I think what's so exciting and promising about this is it allows the problem to be avoided. So instead of having to manage these difficult decisions, you ensure that that pregnancy as best as you can be, won't have that genetic mutation that you're looking out for. Got it. Let's take the other side now and 
I've heard from our, you know, we've known for a long time uh, that uh, women's eggs have a, a, a sell by date, um, for, for lack of a better term. Uh, and we always thought that uh, men's sperm didn't have that. Um, and obviously, we've now uh, found or seen that uh, uh, men's sperm also have a, a sell by date and they can uh, contribute or have a, a greater possibility of having some other uh, sorts of problems or defects. Um, are there specific, is another question, are there specific sperm analyses to be recommended to an older prospective father whose genetic profile and family history may be unknown, possibly because he was adopted? Um, I never said these questions were gonna be easy, so somebody grab that one for me. These are great questions. You know, Sinem alluded to the study, for example, that we're doing. I think it's one of the exciting things at Columbia is that there's a lot of times very innovative new things that can be offered to help with patients. This would be a, an example of one where there are certain um, mutations like the mosaicism issue where there could be a mutation that's not found in the man's blood. It's not found in the skin biopsy. It's isolated to the sperm. And the challenge, of course, is if that sperm fertilizes the egg, that mutation will be passed on to the offspring. Um, one of the things that we're able to do now for men who are at risk for this is to be able to test their sperm, to be able to pick out those cases where there's low rates of this mutation in the sperm. So the blood of both couples seems fine, the mutation is just in the sperm. We now have the ability to test the sperm to see if that specific mutation is also found in the sperm. If it isn't, that's incredibly reassuring. You can say you're not at risk of passing this kind of mutation down. If the mutation is found in the sperm, then they have the option to see someone like Dr. Grips and like Sam to test the embryos and only transfer those that do not have them. And that's- um, Steph, that's how you're smart add, there. Tell oh, just adding is that I agree with Zeb, I work. Um, and I also, the, the, we, talk, we are talking about sperm much more frequently in sessions than we are just eggs now. Uh, everyone's population is getting older and having kids and dad gets to join the conversation now too. I, um, but the, dad's risk, dad's age increases the risk for a lot of those 7,000 conditions that Wendy mentioned. They aren't recessive conditions. They don't need both parents. And there are those de novo changes that happen brand new. It seems to be coming from nowhere. Mm. And screening the sperm for 7,000, well, that's probably a high number, let's say 4,000, 3,000 conditions is really difficult. And once you test the sperm, you can no longer use it, right? Like a sperm is one cell, you have to test it and you lose it. So now you're having to make an assumption based off of a simple test, is that present in all of the sperm? Mm. So pre, I think pre-pregnancy screening for dad's age is tricky. Um, we know some of the risks, but some of the risks dad's age impose aren't single gene disorders. Dad's age increases the risk for autism or mental health disorders, or um, potentially there's, well, I won't go there, but those are all like threshold things of, are there multiple genetic mutations that together with environment add up um, and cause a condition and we can't, our technology is not good for this. So we can give counseling and that's where a genetic counselor and working with our providers comes in handy is the education, just the, the empiric risk that what is historically done in genetics where we don't have a single cause and we can't give specifics, but we can give general information. What is the age related risk? Are you interested in this? Can you use a sperm donor? Can you take away that age related risk and get pregnant alternatively? And in a pregnancy, the best screen is ultrasound. Um, there's where there's some more testing in a pregnancy, still not perfect, but ultrasound is the biggest recommendation for dad's age in a successful pregnancy. Hmm. You know, I think we've alluded to this as, as we've gone along, but maybe you can distill it down for us. What are some of the limitations of testing? Because I think uh, parents will hear some of these things and their mind kind of takes off into science fiction areas. Uh, what are some of the limitations? How do you reel them back into, in, into reality? So first we have to know the mutation, what we're testing for. 
to be able to test bridge which, which Stephanie mentioned. Uh, so uh, second, I would say reproductive aging is a big limitation because we get to work with less eggs that are chromosomally balanced. So that certainly eliminates the number of embryos that we are going to work with. And uh, also uh, reproductive aging related uh, decline in the ovarian reserve, that's the limitation. So uh, mother's age uh, is a limitation. So it's really helpful if the patients seek our help uh, sooner than later. And uh, that's the answer of your question, but may I add to the previous discussion about yes, sperm? Please. Also, so um, the uh, for a man, let's say if he has a child and has uh, and he finds that exact mutation is present in his sperm uh, higher, and uh, uh, so basically we could detect uh, a, a mutation that's uh, even like zero point two percent. So if it's higher than the uh, what we expect uh, to repeat in the future if that new mutation, you could even test the embryos for that new mutation uh, that the previous child had. So that's something to add to because I, I saw that as a question in the chat box, uh, people were asking about sperm testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could test the embryos that uh, if a couple is at risk uh, mm -hmm. for uh, inheriting a new mutation again, even though they don't have it in their blood or their skin or their saliva, if it's present in the sperm, uh, we could test the embryos for it. Hmm. Wendy, let's go back to that um, buy a toaster when you want a guarantee uh, kind of story. Uh, <clears throat> because again, parents, I think, will want some sort of reliability or assurance about this. Uh, we go back to the New York Times saying that um, this uh, prenatal testing, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing and so forth is often wrong. We don't want to get into whether or not the times are often wrong. Um, <laughs> it's often wrong. That's a, <laughs> that's a, wait, that was my outside voice. All right, sorry. Um, but tell me about that. What, sure. Obviously there's never a hundred percent in any of this. Uh, how do you handle that kind of a question? And, and, are there numbers that you can attach to this? So let me be really clear. And this is where folks like Stephanie, especially are so thoughtful uh, in terms of educating patients. There are the time, I'm just gonna bring out the times, no offense, but the, we need to set the record straight here. Um, so the testing that was talked about in the New York Times article was something that's done prenatally when the woman's already pregnant and a peripheral blood sample that's taken that looks at little fragments of the fetal DNA that are floating around. And it was made to be able to make a diagnosis of uh, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. That's what it was uh, set up to do. And it is a screening test. Let me emphasize and underline screening test, right? It is not a diagnostic test. So with that, if you remember back to your epidemiology for the providers out there, their sensitivity, their specificity, positive predictive value. And within that positive predictive value, one of the incredible things for those of you who are old enough to remember this, when we used to do things like triple screen or quad screen or new translucency or any of those things, our positive predictive value could be as low as single digits, you know, so one to five to 10%, especially depending on the age of the woman. This test, by contrast, that positive predictive value, depending on the age of the woman, could be 50%, 90%, but it depends on what you're trying to screen for, and it depends very much on the age of the woman and the sort of the prevalence of that condition amongst that cohort. So, but it is a screen screening test. It is not a diagnostic test. The test that we oftentimes do in terms of there's a specific condition in the family and we're going in and we know the specific address to look for, the specific mutation, if you will, that test very, very rarely do we make a mistake. I'm not saying never because I think we've all seen occasional times when that happens, but that is a very specific test with very high positive or negative predictive value in terms of that. So the important thing is, is this a screening test? Is it diagnostic? 
diagnostic test. No test is perfect. Realize that literally no test in medicine is ever perfect. And so what are the limitations in terms of doing that? And have you done anything as a double check to get around that? But um, within this, again, um, you just need to understand what test you're taking. And then um, it's all that fine print at the bottom, but it does spell out exactly what those uh, potential pitfalls are. Ron, I suspect that you come across this pretty often in terms of uh, dealing with, with patients and genetic counseling and who, who should be uh, screened and, and counseled and so forth. Um, do you agree with what Wendy said there, or uh, do you have anything else to add to that? Ron will never disagree with me, by the way. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> uh, I, I tried, you know. I did a shot. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree um, more. And I have to point out the harm that that New York Times article did. It was inaccurate, not well-researched, incorrect, and misleading. And as you could tell from all the letters that came there, but every letter and everybody that tried to send the correct information couldn't make up for all the patients the next week. I don't want that test. I don't want to have it. It's bad. And I, I think that um, that, that really was, was a disservice. I don't know your relationship with the times, but I can tell you speaking for the medical community that does this, that really was problematic. Um, I, I do, you know, want to point out that there are problems with the public's understanding of genetic tests in both directions. And Wendy talked about what we should screen for, what what uh, single gene disorders we should screen for. He said, not hemochromatosis, maybe we should do it for Tay-Sachs disease. But there's another component to this discussion, and that's the laboratories that make a fortune by screening for the most tests that they can screen for. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any particular body right now that makes these decisions and has the authority to say, you shouldn't screen for this because it's not a bad disease. It's not something we should even be telling moms about. Mm -hmm. And alternatively, you have labs that are in this war of numbers. Well, my lab can do 500 tests. My lab can do 600. And, and that's when we wind up. The harder you push the technology and the, the rarer the disorders is when you get the false results and the low positive predictive value. So there, there really needs to be. And again, I. I think that meetings like this with practitioners are, are really critically important. And what we don't do is we don't do a great job of educating the public about what all of this means and even educating the practitioners. Now, you know, I, I don't want to get into politics, but the problem is some of these labs make $3 billion a year. They have the ability to, you know, to educate to, to their side, but, but we really need to have really clear, consistent understand. So yes, I understand with, um, exa and, and agree exactly with what Wendy says, but it's, 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 it's complicated. Yeah, it, it, it always is. I'm looking at the time and, and I wanna be respectful of all of your time uh, because it's something that we uh, need to finish up so that it's kind of bite-sized. One of the things that I uh, always do uh, as we do these webinars and, and as we wrap up is I like to ask each of our panelists for a little uh, nugget of wisdom, uh, a take home uh, pearl that you want our viewers to remember to take home from this. So if you had one thing, Stephanie, you get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got that look of the teacher calling on you when you haven't done your homework um is give me one thing that somebody um uh, that you want our viewers to remember out, out of all of this i think it i echoing kind of like what wendy had mentioned is there's no perfect test in medicine and we can't mitigate all risk but as a team and with all of these technologies, we can help families understand their specific risk and guide them through the whole process of family planning and family growing to get them the information that's 
most appropriate to them, whether it's pre-pregnancy, during the pregnancy, or as a child's growing. And I think that's all, that, that, that's a great point. And I think it's also important then that we realize the value of uh, being involved with uh, the team effort that you'll see at Columbia, where you'll have all of these levels of expertise starting before you get pregnant all the way through the testing and then taking care of uh, mom and dad and child afterwards. So I think that's really important. Um, I'm gonna go kind of counterclockwise here on, on my screen. And that means Sinem, you're up. So um, my take home messages are embryogenetic testing for single uh, gene conditions is highly accurate. It's more than 98% accurate. And, uh, and I would like the audience to don't hesitate to screen your patients early, carrier screening uh, at the pre-pregnancy stage. Don't hesitate to refer your patients to a fertility specialist or a multidisciplinary group like us early on before the affected child happens or affected pregnancy happens and it's terminated. Um, and uh, before the woman ages that the reproductive aging doesn't allow us to have any eggs or embryos. Okay. So these are my take home messages. Very good. Ron, you're up. <laughs> tell me something that you want people. I think I suspect you already uh, gave us one of those nuggets, but tell me what you want people to remember. Um, I want them to remember that genetic testing's not going away. It's continuing to change. Um, I just want to say that tomorrow I could walk into my office. I could do a procedure on a patient. I could sequence a fetus, every gene, every, every abnormality. I know everything I could get from sequence. Within two years, I won't even have to do a procedure. Within two, and then this has been done already, I could draw blood from the mom and I could do a complete sequence on a 10 week fetus. The reason I want everybody to understand where this is going, we need to have a discussion. The technology is not going away. We, and that's everybody on this call, need to have a discussion about what we're gonna do with the information how we're gonna educate people and how we're going to, like every other test in, in, Megan, in, in medicine. And it's not, it's not the labs, it's not the professors at the university, it is the practitioners who should be there because they have the responsibility to our patients. And that's really what's important. Like we see how misrepresentation can be problematic, and it, again, there's no right or wrong answer now because we haven't even had the discussion. It's time to have the discussion. You're right. As, as happens so often in science, the, the science and the technology outraces uh, our ability to understand what to do with it and what, what the ethics are that, that are involved with it. And we need to have that, that discussion. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Wendy, I, I'm not going to let you be the senior author at the end here. I think Zev is going to get that one tonight. So you tell me, what would you like to have people hear? Remember what you heard, and in a year, it's all going to be new. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I mean by that is that sometimes we get ambiguous results. We will have less ambiguity in the future. We'll be able to resolve some of those things. Some places where we couldn't find answers, we'll be able to find answers. We're going to be using new technology to see things that we currently can't see in what we do. And most exciting for me is that we're also going to have treatments for some of these conditions. So some of these conditions that we might have been um, very concerned about will be less concerned about. But I will say the last thing is that uh, what we do, we're not equitable in. And I'm just going to air our dirty laundry, which is that the services that we can provide, we can't provide equally to all of the patients that we serve. And this is something that we as a field really need to do better by. And we only do that by being inclusive, being inclusive about everyone in terms of uh, different ancestral groups, uh, different walks of life. And I hope we'll be getting there with that as one of our big moves forward. Well said, well said. Zev, you get the last word. That's uh, such a, an outstanding discussion from everybody. Um, and I think for everybody who is listening, 
it's 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 became clear how important it is. Number one, that this is a very nuanced, complex, evolving field, and I think particularly because of that, you can imagine for for many of the providers, there's a lot of questions, a lot of new things, which can be sometimes overwhelming. For the patient, it's so much more so, and I think it really speaks to how important it is to have responsible integrated care to get the kind of advice that you're hearing here from people who are really focused on the patient outcomes and not having the patient try to navigate this by themselves and to have that sort of network to help provide the the providers and critically the patients to take it off their shoulders and to help them through this in a responsible way is really critical. Also well said. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for really an amazing uh, discussion uh, this evening and, and so educational. And I think to take uh, a little bit of what each of you said, uh, maybe especially Ron there, is that uh, we should all, all of our practitioners who are listening in, we are maybe the Johnny Appleseeds uh, and we rely on the practitioners to be the force multipliers, to use that military term, to go out and take and spread this knowledge. It's all well and good that we have it. We tell the practitioners, but until the practitioners use that knowledge, spread it to their patients, spread it to everyone else that they know, other practitioners and so forth, um, we're only going to be sort of preaching to the choir. So please do that. Expand that. Be the force multipliers. Thank you all. Remember, this will be on the uh, Columbia Children's YouTube channel uh, in a day or so, and you'll be able to pick up on some of the gems uh, that we had. Thank you all for listening, and thank you all to the panel for a terrific discussion. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.